there's more in there. Yeah. It's in the box. Oh, but you have enough. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing that. Amen, amen, amen. Good morning, Copper Hill. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, and welcome. Welcome, everyone. It's good to see everyone this day. Oh, does anyone know what day this is? Yeah, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice, let us rejoice and be glad in it and be glad in it. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made. Amen, amen. This is the day. And I welcome you, welcome everyone in the name of Jesus Christ. You came in one way, you will leave this place another. Transformed by the grace of God. Those of you that are watching us, uh, uh, you as well. You came one way and you're going you're gonna to leave after this service another. We welcome you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. So, we have sung our opening song. Let us, um, let us un um, unite in prayer. Um, actually, our call to worship, is that what? Nope, I was right, prayer. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> our prayer. <laughs> our apologies. Let us pray. O ever-present God, who is at the side of every creature, in creation, renew our, our lives so that we may discern and do your will and do what is good and acceptable and perfect. In Jesus' name, we pray this. Amen. 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 Now we're at the call to worship. Um, will you stand if you are able? And I say, you who are many are transformed to become one in Christ. We who are many are called to worship God, the three in one. Let us worship God. Amen, amen. And remain standing as we sing our first hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah.
Amen. Please be seated. Um, you see our uh, our offering. We're at the time of offering, and um, those are the ways that we uh, give and receive our offering. And we do all know that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. So um, we will now have our doxology and our prayer of dedication over our our gifts of offering. Oh, wait. Oh, bless. Oh, praise him, all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Okay. And um, a prayer. Let's pray. Pray over um, what God has so richly uh gifted us with and what we have returned a portion of. O oh, Almighty God, you took a baby from the Nile and used him to lead your people to the promised land. Take our offerings, take them for your, your promise in this land and throughout your world. In Jesus Christ, we pray this. Amen. Amen. And now we have our children's message. Oh, ah, scripture reading. Okay. Good morning. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Exodus chapter 1 through Exodus chapter 2, verse 10. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt, Egypt with Jacob, each with his household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, Zublam, Le and Benjamin, Dan, and Naphel, Gad, and Asher. The total number of people born to Jacob were 70. Joseph was already in Egypt. Then Joseph died and all the brothers and the whole generation. But the Israelites were fruitful and pro prolific. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, or they will increase in an event of a war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmakers over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Fithom and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But but the more they were pressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shepra and other Pua. When you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill them. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and they did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt with them, midwives, 
and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because of the, the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let the girl live. Moving on to chapter 2, verse through 10. Okay. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got papyrus basket for him and plastered it with butum and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of the Pharaoh came down to, to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him to her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Our second reading is Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Syria, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist but others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Haiti will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you build on the earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Good morning. <laughs> now, for some of you, this week is going to be kind of special. First day of the fall year of school. Yeah. I remember my first days, and sometimes it was, felt very exciting. Other times, I was a little nervous, maybe a little scared, because I might be a teacher that doesn't know you, and you don't know them. Maybe you'll be with kids that you're not really that familiar with and don't know you. Who do you want them to know about you and who you are? Now today's, today's gospel reading, Jesus talked about to his disciples that were with him and they, he was asking them, who do people say that I am? After all, he had been preaching for a little while now. Actually, he had, thousands of people had heard him preach and seen him perform miracles. And so he asked his disciples, well, what are they saying about me? 
Who do they think that I really am? Well, some of the disciples, as you heard in the gospel reading, said, well, you're like John the Baptist, or maybe Elijah, one of the other prophets, like Jeremiah. But then Jesus said, who do you think that I am? Probably one of the most important questions. Well, Peter, who was never shy to speak up, said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. What a statement. What is the most important thing you want people to know about you? You are so many things. We have such talent in this church, so many skills, so many wonderful young people. But keep in mind, probably one of the most important things to remember about you, you are a child of God, and you are loved. You are always loved. No matter what happens in your life, you're going to have some rough days, and you're going to have some good days. But one thing never changes. You are a child of God, and you can always come to God in prayer, in song, and he will listen because he cares about you. Every single one of you, he cares about you. So it is my prayer for you that you have a wonderful beginning to your new school year and that you never forget that God is there for you. Amen. Thank you, Karen. I almost wanted to break out in song. God will take care of you. Amen. He will. Actually, we will be. <laughs> Later on. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So who, who do you say that I am? Um, and in both our Old Testament lesson and our our gospel lesson deal with that question of identity. Um, in our Old Testament lesson, we're learning about Moses, right? That's, that's the story of Moses and how he came to be and how God was so involved in that uh, because Pharaoh was killing all the boys, all the Hebrew boys. But not, but not him. Well, he wanted to. That was his goal. But God wouldn't allow that to happen. Um, remember that, that promise he made to Abraham. And when God makes a promise to us, God keeps the promise. Right? Amen? Because he is faithful. So, um, so Moses, who was Hebrew, uh, was supposed to be killed but wasn't um, by God, grace of God. Um, grows up uh, with the, in the Pharaoh's house, right? We gloss over this. He had a, a he had a regal upbringing. He was part of royalty, not Hebrew, but you know the the Egyptian royalty. He was part of the the other side. Only God could have made that happen, right? Amen. Only God could have made that happen. So he struggled, as we will see in, in weeks to come. He struggled with identity. That was an issue, definitely an issue for him. Who, who do you say that I am? Well, I, I, I have, and I can say had because she has passed away, but um, I, my cousin, uh, she was my maternal aunt's adopted daughter she adopted her when she was a toddler, um, Lisa. She was a year older than myself, and um, our family told us that she was a, 
adopted. We all knew it wasn't a secret or anything. Um, and actually, it was, it was actually looked at as a great thing. It wasn't anything to be sorryful about or upset about. It was a good thing. Um, I remember one day when she and I were 10 and 11 years year old, year old respectively. I was 10 and she was 11. And we were riding our bicycles and uh, when my cousin suddenly asked me this question, who do you, who do you say that I am? Uh, what have you been told about who I am? Who do you think I am? And I very innocently responded, you're my cousin. No, she replied, where do you think I came from? Well, I said, I'm not sure what you mean by all that, but you are my cousin. You're my cousin, you'll always be my cousin. We grew up like sisters, right? Because our mothers were sisters. And we lived like three houses away, it was beautiful. But she, it, she was plagued by identity. Who, who, who do you think I am? And it bothered her. I remember how much it irritated her, my response, because I wasn't saying what she wanted me to say. But my parents never really went into detail in telling me or any of us about her biological identity, nor did it matter to any of us. She, she was Lisa. She was our, our cousin, period. But beloved, you know, it truly mattered to her. And she went on for many, many years, assuming various identities that may or may not have represented her biological background. She, someone told her that they thought one of her parents was of the Jewish faith. So she began to assume that identity. Um, uh, this bizarre and often unex, unexplained behavior it perplexed our, our friends and mutual acquaintances. They were baffled by her confusion. Um, they, like the rest of us, loved her for who she was. A friend, a cousin, you know? Well, Jesus in our gospel lesson this morning puts this question of identity directly to his disciples. And after asking the crowds, asking what the crowds say about him, what the observers say about him, Jesus directs the light on those closest to him and he asks them point blank. Okay, that's what everybody else says. Now, who, who do you say that I am? It's a, it's a good question. It's a probing question that forces us as Christians to ask where we stand with this Jesus. Where do we stand with this Jesus and how far are we willing to, to travel with him? It's a, it's a question that leads us uh, to then ask, who do we believe this Jesus to be? Who do we believe this Jesus to be? In a similar way, it's, it's, it's as my cousin's question. How do we answer, the, how we answer this question makes all the difference in the world. However, the answer to this question doesn't change the reality of who Jesus is, but it shapes and defines who we will be. Amen? Our, our confession and answer to this question of who Jesus is is not, it just doesn't shape our, our daily lives, but it forms the way we live. It forms the way we live both as a, as a church and as a community. For example, if we believe Jesus to be a wise teacher, then we may believe that Christianity is, is, is merely a matter of, of our consenting to a, a list of, of beliefs and principles. But if we believe that Jesus is a great moral example, right, his, his, what he did, Right? his healings, his teachings, he's a, he's a great example, then we will understand Christianity to be about our, how, how we behave and how we stick to a set of, of ideals. But beloved, what if we really live and believe that Jesus, our companion, our friend, is truly the Messiah, truly the son of the living God? 
Only Matthew in verses 17 and 19 connects Peter's confession of Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God. He connects it with the church. Maybe that's why Jesus says, Peter, you're the rock of the church, because he was able to make that connection. In fact, this is one of the only two occurrences of the word where church or ecclesia is in the Gospels. So for Matthew, the church, the community of Jesus, the community of believers, the followers, is, is related to the confession that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. That Jesus Christ is the son of the living God as the church and the community of believers in Jesus Christ. It is, it's, it's people who, who live together. It's people, it's defined by, by the reign of God manifested in that community. That the reign of God that is manifested in Jesus, the Messiah and the Son. But affirming, affirming this about Jesus, it doesn't mean that we fully understand, um, fully understand the implications of that confession because beloved saying the right things does no always equate to living them out amen we can be hearers of the word but are we doers we can say the right things about jesus and still not know their full implications or their full impacts for our lives the disciples certainly didn't appreciate fully what such a confession might mean Peter himself would discover that saying the words, Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God, as, a, as an important first step that that might be, it's not the same thing as living those words or embodying them in the life of the kingdom. We know shortly thereafter, he denied him, amen? Don't know him, huh? What? So following Jesus is a holy adventure. And it's often left the disciples dazed and confused as the hard road of discipleship opened up before them. They were being persecuted, killed, put to death. It was serious. But it, was, it is a way of life that demands active faith, not just belief. Peter would soon discover discipleship means that one day we might be led to places we rather not go. Faith is not the absence of doubt. Faith is our daily prayerful struggle with God in which we learn the full implication of being the church, the full implication of being a people whose life together is shaped by the confession that Jesus Christ, you are the, the Messiah, the son of the living God. And it's not a, an easy journey. It's not a, a, a piece of cake. It's a, it's a difficult journey. Beloved, the way this confession leads is costly and demanding. But on the other hand, it's a great gift, the greatest gift. The way of Jesus leads to a full and abundant life, not just here, but forever, right? Everlasting life. In asking, who do you say that I am? Jesus invites the disciples and the church into relationship to walk with him. That, that often hard and demanding road of discipleship. You see, in making this confession, we are saying that we want our lives, our witness, and our ministry to be defined by Christ's life, Christ's witness, Christ's ministry. Beloved, truth be known, we are often guilty of projecting our own ideas about the nature of discipleship onto Jesus. We, we often want to shape our confession rather than, letting it, rather than letting it shape an identity to our life as a church and people come from him. Amen? My older cousin and I, as I said before, we were raised like sisters, as our, our moms were sisters and However, identifying with who she was biologically, her biological heritage, this unknown, this question mark in her life, it was more important to her 
especially as we got older and our teenage years came upon us and unfortunately we grew distant because of it. Unfortunately, I, I didn't fit or measure up to her image of who she thought her bio, biological identity was. It's okay. Still love her. <laughs> we'll always love her. But beloved, when Jesus invites us to answer the question, we can let go of everything else that was Lord in our lives and the things that we have allowed to shape our identity. But if we ignore this invitation to identify with Christ, we can wind up just as confused as a person who spends their entire life in this world searching for answers to why. Who am I? Why was I born? Who am I? Why, why did this happen? Why was I put up for adoption? Why did this, you know? But when we learn to trust and believe in Christ, we realize that we are a gift from God to the world. And therefore, our reason for being born is clear. Amen? We are purposed, each and every one of us. No matter how we got here or who actually gave birth to us, we are all purposed. We're wonderfully made and purposely fully made. Amen? Our sense of purpose is directed when we become more Christ-like. The closer we draw to Jesus, that's, that's when things start becoming apparent to us. Our gifts and our talents, talents we didn't even realize we had, come bubbling out. We're like, I didn't think I could do that. God did. <laughs> he created you. <laughs> he knows everything about you, every hair on your head every freckle, every, everything, <laughs> every blemish, things you don't even know yet, <laughs> he knows. <laughs> so people who become vessels of God are being, um, are being born how we're born and unlimited we are unlimited by the grace and mercy of a loving God who created us and purposed our lives. We can know and understand that God is the true giver of life. And through his son, Jesus, we are redeemed and we can live forever eternally. So we don't have to live this life in turmoil, wondering where we come from or, or live in fear of death. What happens then? Oh. Instead, we can live as God intended us to live, as freely redeemed children that understand that all that we are and all that we have is from God. God is our strength and our source. God is our, uh, God is, is everything, our alpha and our omega. And the gift of Jesus was an attempt on God's behalf to reconcile and to bring us closer into relationship with him. Jesus atoned for all that stuff in our lives that is not pleasing to God, that does nothing but separate us from God and destroys that relationship. Jesus came to atone for all that, to obliterate all that. And it doesn't reflect, it doesn't, when we don't embrace that, it doesn't reflect our confession of knowing who Jesus is. Jesus is our example of how to live in this world and our hope of our next life. So thanks be to God that life did not end for Jesus on the cross. And praise be to God that it does not end for you and me. But this morning, beloved, let's focus, let's concern ourselves with how we allow Jesus to manifest himself in our lives. Jesus is I am. I am, and so much more, beloved, if we only acknowledge and allow him into our lives so that we can truly understand our purpose. Our purpose is his purpose. So if you can hear my voice, raise your right hand. 
Raise your right hand if you can hear my voice. Whether you're actually here or you're watching us, raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I am. You are my redeemer. And my salvation. Jesus. You are my liberator and my light. I acknowledge that I cannot live apart from you. And I thank you. I am Jesus Christ, the Messiah. I thank you for you, for you are Lord of my life and you gave your life an atonement for my sin you love me when I'm unlovable and so I dedicate whatever time I have in this world to your will and your service. In your name, I am. I pledge this. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Absolutely. You said that prayer. You have acknowledged the living Christ. If you said that prayer in your heart, you've acknowledged and affirmed that identity of who he is. Not who the world says he is, but who you say that he is. The Lord of your life. Amen? Amen. Amen. And so God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Whatever's going on in your life, you have dedicated to that identity of the great I am. So God will take care of you. Amen? Let's sing it. You good?
take care of you. Please be seated. and living into our identity as your children. And now we're, we'll lift up some prayers, especially for people, uh, people in need, and people right in our community in need, and people far away that have needs. continue to pray for, for Cal and for Harrison. Anyone else? Continue prayers for Jimmy Allen. Traveling prayers for your son, first name, Brian. Your brother Robert Holson, Holson, Robert Holson, Karen, Karen's surgery, Wednesday, Deanna's mom. For the world we share with all creation, for the plants and animals we see each day, and the wilderness we have never seen, we give you thanks, O Lord, and ask your help in living into our identity as stewards of your earth. We pray especially for definitely the victims of uh, the fires that are going on and other natural disasters and, and tragedies. We pray for those families. We pray for the pets that are often left behind. Anyone else that we need to lift up? Mm hmm? Lauren, Elise, and Nathan. Ethan, Ethan, your cousins. We pray for local, national, and international leaders. All of our local um, leaders and our international leaders, those whose policies we appreciate and those with whom we struggle, Lord, we give you thanks and ask that you be at their side, guiding them to act in justice and mercy. We pray especially for the leaders here in um, the local, our local areas in Granby and Lord, we lift them up. We lift up all the way up to the president. We lift him up. Speak to them all, Lord. Speak to them. Guide them. Lord, for our joys and concerns that occupy our thoughts today, those we have spoken aloud and those we, we ponder inwardly. Lord, we give you thanks and we ask that you, you be at our side, guiding us to recognize that our, our help is in the name of, of the Lord, 
who made heaven and earth. So Lord, hear the prayers that we lift in silence. Here are prayers that are on our hearts and minds this day that haven't been spoken. We accept and we heed all these prayers through Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray when we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and our trespasses as those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen, beloved. And now may the Lord who made heaven and earth May the Christ who lived and died for all and the Spirit who renews our minds and hearts, may he abide with you and all of God's people now and forevermore. Go forth in peace. Amen.